Okay, so I, I was given the brief to um, try and explain um, why we're interested and, and bothered about typhoid. Really. We get quite excited about it and we forget that everybody else perhaps doesn't. So, yeah. um, so the picture on the left is, is the sort of classic textbook picture of a Victorian slum and always makes me think of the, the big cities of the Industrial <coughs> Revolution. Um, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, huge population suddenly expanding. No access to sanitation or clean water. Um, and prime conditions for outbreaks of disease. Um, cholera outbreaks, as in Jon Snow. Um, measles and of course typhoid as well um, and many of you might have seen the, the recent episode of Call the Midwife um, so it's not so long ago and um, that was what the early 1960s that they were referring to um, and people were still being identified with typhoid owing to their, their living conditions within the UK the picture on the, the other side I can't do my lefts and rights for you so you'll have to do <laughs> this um, is typhoid Mary who I've, most people have heard of um, she was a cook in New York um, and was found to be the first asymptomatic carrier of t Salmonella typhi in the United States. Um, so she cooked for many families in New York in the 1900s and was eventually um, tracked down after infecting at least 51 people, although people do feel that she probably infected many more. Um, and three people died um, following sort of being infected by this good lady, who was apparently a very good cook. But, um, <laughs> I don't want to put anybody off the, the lunch, you see. So. Um, she refused treatment for, for typhoid. She refused to have her gallbladder re um, removed and was actually quarantined by the city authorities until her death um, in 1938. And she died of pneumonia, interestingly. So. And typhoid wasn't just limited to, to big cities um, in the UK or in the United States. Um, I love this anecdote. Um, in 1862, a ship was sailing from Norway to Canada, and it docked in Quebec. During the two months that it took to get from, from Europe um, across the Atlantic, there'd been an outbreak of typhoid and measles. 49 of the 280 passengers on board had died, um, and a further 31 died in hospital in Canada. So the sort of wider picture is the, the value of immunisation. But you can also just pause to think about what that ship must have been like to, to be travelling on at the time. So it's proof that diseases have always travelled. Nicely segues in, I hope. So is typhoid a, a disease of the return traveller? And Andy touched on this. Um, many of you are familiar with giving typhoid vaccinations in, in travel clinics. Um, holiday and gap year destinations have become increasingly um, exotic, or I would perhaps say dangerous, um, depending on your point of view. And that increases the risk of um, exposure to disease. Gone are the days of interrailing around Europe with your ticket and you know rucksack on your back. Sort of thing. In 2014, there were 311 um, laboratory confirmed cases of Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi. 60% of these, as, as Andy said earlier, were typhoid. More worryingly, 40% um, were paratyphoid, for which there's currently no vaccine available. Um, the majority of these cases were found to be travel related. Um, but 78% of these cases, and this is probably relevant for yourselves, um, were people visiting friends and relatives, VFR, as you might put on your codes. Um, and in my experience of, of giving vaccines, people visiting <coughs> friends and relatives are much less likely to seek um, pre-vaccination before they travel, um, probably due to a different perception of risk. So does that leave typhoid as a disease of poverty? And of course the answer is yes. Um, it's spread by the faecal oral route um, and will always <coughs> flourish in areas of poor sanitation where people have limited access to sufficient clean water. There's difficulties in diagnosing the disease um, and if you combine that with limited access to health care or poorly regulated pharmacy or drug markets, as, as seen here, um, <coughs> there's all these um, things have contributed to the rise in drug-resistant strains of typhoid. I would argue that, that all societies are potentially vulnerable to typhoid outbreaks. War and political instability, which we're seeing a lot of at the moment, can cause any society to break down um, and structures to collapse. Um, Zimbabwe, Iraq, Syria, all producing refugees, all have typhoid, but they're all countries that have previously been considered to have good public health structures and, <coughs> and a functioning society. Um, an example of this is this good lady pictured. She's an Iraqi refugee 
Um, this picture was taken in Dunkirk earlier this year, which is just 20, 25 miles from the UK as the crow flies. Um, she's carrying her son who has Down syndrome, and as you can see, classic um, conditions for um, waterborne diseases um, and fecal oral type diseases such as typhoid. So does that mean typhoid is not our problem? Um, as you see from the map, which we've already seen, we like ours because it's got better colours. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not a, typhoid is not a tropical disease of long ago and, and far away. Many areas of the world are at risk um, for typhoid and increasingly for paratyphoid. Europe is currently experiencing the largest population movement since the Second World War. The war in Syria alone has created more than 4.8 million refugees. They are mainly in the neighbouring countries and hundreds of thousands of more um, refugees within Europe. As we've seen in recent years with other diseases such as SARS, Ebola and Zika viruses, um, diseases travel. I knew I'd forget to click. This is the refugee picture. Um, and the report on the screen um, describes a typh typhoid outbreak in Japan um, with the source found to be an asymptomatic carrier from Nepal. The carrier state of typhoid ensures that the disease remains highly portable. No reservoir or vector is needed for onward transmission. So how do we control typhoid? <coughs> In an ideal world, we would improve water supply and sanitation for everybody. Um, but as you can imagine, this would be expensive and arguably impossible to achieve, um, unless anybody's got any you know, secret plan that they're thinking of, certainly in the short term. So public health measures and education certainly have an important role in the control of typhoid, particularly in areas that would be at risk and or are known to have um, outbreaks. Early case identification, prompt treatment and contact tracing are all very important in controlling the disease. Um, but they do require a robust public health system, and you all represent <coughs> a robust public health system and probably more nurses than most, or many developing countries can poke a stick at. So, mm -hmm. um, so in the meantime, we have vaccines. In 2008, the World Health Organization produced a position paper recommending the use of typhoid vaccines in areas, or typhoid vaccine programs rather, in areas of um, increasing <coughs> and continuous high burden of, of typhoid. And here I pass you over to Selina, who will tell you a bit more about why we're doing vaccine. Great. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. So I think Maria's really <laughs> highlighted the, the global burden <coughs> of typhoid. And um, despite the WHO saying that, yes, we should be using typhoid vaccines to reduce this burden, um, no country yet has implemented um, countrywide programs for use, despite having two licensed vaccines available and I'm just going to discuss some of the issues surrounding that and some of the reasons and where we're going in terms of the future of typhoid uh, vaccine <coughs> development and research. So in the past, uh, it might surprise some of you or perhaps not, but the first typhoid vaccine was actually <coughs> developed in 1896. So that's a long time and we've had them for a very long time and despite that we're still looking for a better one. Um, this photograph is of um, some military personnel in the United States, taken in 1909. They're queuing up to receive the whole cell killed uh, typhoid vaccine. So it was a heat inactivated, phenol inactivated vaccine. And it was reasonably efficacious, so as in the amount of protection it conferred uh, to the individual was about 73% over three years. We no longer use it, and the main reason is because it was so reactogenic. People didn't like having it, and so in the context of that, newer vaccines were developed. And these are the vaccines we currently use today. So they're quite different. So one is the oral live attenuated vaccine called TY21A. Um, for this vaccine, you have to take about three doses, though in the States they have a four dose regimen. And it's only licensed from the age of five years and above. And in terms of its efficacy, the latest Cochrane review, which was published in 2014, showed that it was about 35% at one year but 62% at seven years. And this could be related to the fact that this vaccine was tested in endemic regions such as in Chile and Indonesia, and there might be an element of natural boosting through natural exposure, which contributed to the efficacy over a longer duration of time. The other vaccine that uh, is perhaps more commonly used and uh, you might be familiar <coughs> with is the parenteral VI polysaccharide vaccine. Um, this is just one example of a trade name for it. 
Um, and the efficacy of this vaccine isn't too bad. It's about 70% at one year and 60% at two years. But what we do know is that because it's a polysaccharide vaccine, um, it doesn't induce T cell help. So it's essentially a T cell independent uh, antigen. And that means that it doesn't induce memory. So when you get re-exposed or you get re-vaccinated, it doesn't result in a booster response. You don't get higher antibodies the second time you come around to um, encountering the antigen. And also because it's a polysaccharide vaccine, we know these don't actually stimulate immune responses in infants. So it's only licensed from the age of two years and above. So you might say, well, we've got two reasonably efficacious vaccines. Why do we have to keep doing typhoid research? Why don't we just use them? And I guess part of the problem with these vaccines is we can't use them in young kids. And in terms of the burden of typhoid disease, so there are more than 22 million cases each year with 1% mortality, and that's in the context of antibiotic use. So we have around 200,000 deaths each year, and more than 50% of these occur in the under five age group. As demonstrated, we can't use these vaccines in that age group. So we're looking for better vaccines that we can use in, in younger children and infants and uh, that are more efficacious as well. So in terms of vaccine development, where we're currently at, uh, the top two um, vaccines listed here are the currently licensed vaccines. And then these ones I've highlighted in red are our VI conjugate vaccines, which I'm going to discuss in some more detail. Because as you can see, uh, oh, there's no pointer, sorry. Um, three of these have been licensed in their own countries. So two of them have been licensed in India and one's been licensed in China. So they're sort of further along the pipeline in terms of development. Down the bottom there are several live attenuated um, oral vaccines that are in development now. And there's also, uh, they're at varying stages in terms of um, clinical trials. So what are VI conjugate vaccines? So you might be familiar with the concept of a conjugate vaccine because we do use them very commonly in um, our infant schedule here. So conjugate vaccines such as the Hib, um, meningococcal or pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. And essentially what this involves is taking a polysaccharide or a, sh a sugar type molecule. And in this case of typhoid, the polysaccharide is the VI antigen, which is the capsule surrounding the bacteria. So you take that polysaccharide capsule and then you link it with a protein. And that protein could be anything. So typically the ones we see are things like tetanus toxoid, diphtheria toxoid, those sorts of things. And when you link it with the protein, <coughs> it presents to the immune system slightly differently. And so now it's a T-dependent antigen essentially. And what that <coughs> means is that you enlist T-cell help so you can generate memory B-cells. This is thought to result in a booster effect long term. You might have more persistent immunity and we know that conjugate vaccines are immunogenic in infants. So it's no surprise that in terms of the field of typhoid research, we've gone down this track of developing a VI conjugate vaccine. And we have several of them in development, but the one that has been most commonly studied is called uh, the VI Reaper vaccine. You might not have seen Reaper used very commonly as a, as a protein carrier, but it's a Pseudomonas aeruginosa exotoxin A uh, protein. So this vaccine has been, has been studied um, in Vietnam and it appeared to be very promising. So what they did was they immunised children between the ages of two to five years. Children received two doses six weeks apart and at one year the efficacy of this vaccine was 94%, which is higher than the currently used one, which is 70%. In addition to that, um, the same group then studied whether or not it was immunogenic in infants and they administered it alongside the uh, routine EVI schedule. And so it was given at two, four, six months and a 12 month booster. And they demonstrated that it was immunogenic. So yes, infants produced uh, antibodies in response to the vaccine. And they also demonstrated that it didn't um, interact or interfere with the antibody response to the concurrently administered vaccines. So, I mean, in general, in theory, VI conjugate va vaccines appear to work very well. <laughs> So why are we still talking about them? Why haven't they just been licensed? Why aren't we using them? Well, the problem with, with the VI Reaper vaccine at that time was there wasn't much interest in typhoid vaccine research and drug companies and manufacturers didn't really want to take it on board and, and continue with it. So the National Institute of Health, who developed this vaccine and ran these clinical trials, then underwent technology transfer and gave the vaccine to a company in China where it's currently licensed. 
we do have several other VI conjugate vaccines and you might think that if one conjugate vaccine has been tested, we could use all of them in the field, why not? But unfortunately, we also know that not all the vaccines behave in the same way. And in terms of how the antigen itself is, um, is handled, it can affect how immunogenic it is. So in light of that, the WHO have said, we want efficacy trials for all the conjugate vaccines before they decide to use them. So efficacy trials, sorry, if I can speak properly, have um, lots of difficulties with performing them. So essentially what you need to do with an efficacy trial in the field is you want to know what the incidence <coughs> of a disease is. So with typhoid, you want to have a surveillance study to say this is how much typhoid there is at this time. You then implement your vaccine and you follow them up. So maybe in a year or two years time, and then you look at what the incidence is then. And ideally, you want to show a reduction in the incidence, and then you can say this is how efficacious this vaccine is. In order to do that, you need several things. So firstly, you need a good surveillance system. So you need to be able to detect as many cases of typhoid as you can. And part of the problem with that is it takes good infrastructure and good um, healthcare resources, which a lot of these areas where typhoid is endemic, they don't actually have. The cost of performing these studies is considerable as well because you need to enrol a lot of participants. So we're looking at sort of 20,000 people to 50,000 people. And also the time uh, that's required, you need to follow them up for quite a duration of time too. And the other thing is typhoid is a human restricted pathogen, which means that it doesn't infect animals. There's no uh, environmental reservoir that we're aware of. It's just humans. So in terms of testing vaccine efficacy in animal models, that's also very difficult to do. So in light of this, the WHO have then said, well, if you had a successful typhoid challenge study, which you conduct in healthy adults using an appropriate and validated model, and you could provide, uh, it could provide considerable supporting evidence of the efficacy of a VI conjugate vaccine. So you might be thinking, what are you talking about? What's a human challenge model for typhoid? And Andy touched on this earlier. Well, essentially what it is, so this is our Oxford vaccine group uh, human challenge study is essentially we infect people with typhoid and then we see what happens. So <laughs> these, <laughs> that, that's a human challenge study, yes. So um, we've been performing these studies for the last five years or so at the Oxford Vaccine Group. Um, but the original studies were conducted in the 1950s to 70s at the University of Maryland. Um, and what we do is we enrol healthy adult volunteers who are typhoid naive, so they've never been vaccinated, never lived in a country where there's typhoid, never had typhoid before. And then we give them a dose of typhoid bacterium to drink, so in a 30 ml solution. So they drink it, they feel fine, <coughs> and then we follow them up every single day for 14 days. It's an outpatient study, which means they're not hospitalised, they just come in and see us in clinic. And during those appointments, we take a blood sample for blood culture. And we also monitor their symptoms and also check their temperature. And then a subset of participants go on to develop typhoid infection. And our criteria for diagnosing typhoid is either having a fever more than 38 degrees for more than 12 hours or a positive <coughs> blood culture. But another subset don't develop typhoid. And that's because the dose of typhoid that we actually challenge people with uh, we know produces an attack rate of 65%. So we, we expect about 65% of our people to get um, typhoid. And this is just an example of what someone who develops typhoid, what their sort of um, symptoms and things look like. So the black line, um, I don't have a point to say. Well, the black line is their temperature. And then you can see it's sort of day eight, day nine, they start to um, have a rise in their temperature and they cross the 38 degree threshold and they have a fever. At the same time, their blood culture is flagged positive, so that's the red uh, boxes down the bottom. And the green line there is their C-reactive protein, so an inflammatory marker, and that also goes up showing that they've got systemic infection. The grey, you can't really see actually, but on day sort of 10, we've started them on antibiotics because that's when we've been notified that the blood culture is positive, that's when they've reached their temperature um, threshold in terms of diagnosis. And so we've started them on antibiotics, and then within a day or two, their fever resolves, their um, CRP comes down, and their bacteremia clears up as well. This, uh, the orange boxes down the bottom looks at um, stool culture, because typhoid shed in the stool. And what you see is around the time of diagnosis as well, they're starting to shed the typhoid bacteria as well. <coughs> As opposed to that, this is someone who doesn't have typhoid and um, you can see their temperature remains less than 38 degrees for the whole duration. Their CRP is um, 
is very low as well. They don't um, ever develop a positive blood culture. And then on day 14, they get treated with antibiotics. So we treat all our participants with antibiotics, regardless of whether or not they're diagnosed. So in terms of developing these models, what we've now done is um, we've demonstrated that we can consistently um, produce an attack rate of 65%, which means that every time we give a cohort of participants this dose of typhoid, about 65% of them will get sick. And so we can use this now to test vaccines, as Andy demonstrated with uh, the previous study. The one that we're currently running, that Maria and I um, are in charge of, is called Vaccines Against Salmonella Typhi. And what it involves is um, recruiting 99 participants, randomising them to three vaccines. So each, uh, each group receives a different vaccine, either a VI conjugate vaccine, which is VI conjugated to tetanus toxoid, a VI polysaccharide vaccine, or a control vaccine. And in this case, our control vaccine is uh, MNACWY. One month after vaccination, we then challenge them with typhoid, and then we then follow them up daily, as, as I explained earlier. And then we'll get a good idea in terms of how protective these vaccines are within our challenge model based on how many people get sick in each vaccine arm. It's currently a blinded study, so we don't know, but hopefully at the end of this year we'll have some idea in terms of how efficacious this uh, new typhoid vaccine is. So that's really what we hope to achieve. So in this context, we really want to know how well does this conjugate vaccine protect against typhoid fever? <coughs> And another interesting thing to look at is um, whether or not this vaccine has any potential effect on clinical disease. So if you received a vaccine but still were, de were to develop typhoid, um, do you have less severe symptoms? We don't really know. It's possible. Could this have any effect on transmission? So does it have any effect on stool shedding? And um, because we have access to this very controlled environment, we see our participants a lot, we're able to collect a lot of blood samples, as you can imagine. So we also are able to look at what the immune system's doing in response to conjugate as opposed to polysaccharide vaccines. Now, I know this all sounds very theoretical and very kind of research-based, um, but essentially what's going to happen as a result of this clinical trial, once we have our efficacy results, this will very much be important in terms of, um, of the opinion that the WHO eventually have in terms of where we're going to go with VI conjugate vaccines, and then that could affect uh, what type of support we receive from Gavi in terms of uh, implementing these vaccines in the field. And I think I don't really need to preach to you guys because everyone here obviously loves vaccines, but <laughs> this is um, from our, um, our friend Bill Gates, who is a big supporter of uh, the research we do here. Well, the Gates Foundation is. I don't know if Bill himself is, but I should. So, anyway, this is a plaque outside of the Gates Foundation in Seattle. And essentially, Bill has said, vaccines save lives. They're the simplest, most inexpensive, most effective way to give all children a shot at a healthy, productive life. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. So, these are the people we'd like to thank, many of our volunteers. But, anyway, thank you for your